from Brisbane, Australia, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this is coming from somewhere in the north of England with an accent like mine, but no, I'm definitely in Brisbane and it's definitely a bit chilly this morning. Thank you to everyone who joined us last week. Um, obviously, it was the first time that we'd ever done it and there was quite a few of you joined but there's an awful lot of you who looked at it afterwards when it was posted up on the page and that's fine by me please let me know if the time slot doesn't work for you i mean i'm hoping that people can watch it maybe when they're waking up whatever um you can even put it on in your car as long as you don't watch it while you're driving because i'm just a bloke sat here talking into his microphone there's not not going to be anything too exciting visually I will let you know, because in some weeks we're going to do some tactical analysis and whatnot. I just want to get the basics right of doing this, doing this live while it's in its infant stages. Please feel free to send comments and questions. Um, don't be alarmed if you don't get an answer straight away, because what I tend to do is go through the topics and then, and then a little later go through the comments so that I'm not sort of bombarded and going from one thing to the next to the next so send your comments send your questions if you'd rather email send them to admin at rugbyleaguecoach.com.au i'm just checking i'm definitely live and i am so that's good the things i want to talk about this week um it's been a pretty light week for news in the nrl um but one of the big things was the there was a few cricket scores in the NRL, so we've had we've had Indigenous round, we've had Retro round, we've had Women in League round, and I think unofficially this was Cricket score round because a lot of the scores blew out. And there's been a few comments knocking around why that may have happened. I'm going to zoom in on one particular area that I feel quite passionate about. But it's funny there, there was also a Cricket score in England. The Lee Centurions, I think, beat the the York City Knights by 100 points, which is unheard of. So we're going to analyse that a little bit, and I'd love to hear your comments. And I've got loads of your questions and comments from uh, from last week's live. Loads of you have sent lots more, <clears throat> so this is going to be jam-packed full of your comments too. I'll go into a little bit of detail looking at the Gold Coast, the franchise as a whole, not just the Titans, but the various things that, that emerged before it. And I argue that, um, regardless of where it is in on earth, um, administrators have got an awful lot of answering to do about that franchise. Um, and then I sort of wrap up with a little bit more about the women's game and also a bit about the school's game. It's a big, big day here in Queensland for the school game. Like I said, please send your comments, please send your questions. I'll keep, I'll keep an eye on the comments and I'll take some time to look at various stages uh, this is your show this is your time it's all about looking at the every level of the game absolutely keen to talk as much about the community game as i can not just nrl and super league but um where it does happen where the fish are swimming is in the nrl and this week the dogs and the tigers and the seagulls certainly seem to me to have checked out do you agree post that in the comments <clears throat> Do you also agree that all those clubs have been affected by front office issues? The famous old master coach, Jack Gibson, said winning starts in the front office. Well, I guess winning can also start in that front office too. What alarmed me about some of the performances at the weekend, and even in previous weeks, because it's not linear, it's not just all happened this weekend, is that player power is alive and well. A player can really dictate how the mood in the dressing room is or a group of players and you've also got to look at what the so-called brotherhood is like in some of these teams I mean are they players in it for themselves do they put the jersey before themselves is the jersey bigger than the group of individuals that exist within that team I would argue that in a lot of cases this can be very questionable but the bit I want to really focus on is that what one thing I think rugby league has lacked in recent years, what it used to be so good at, is rugby league was a huge part of our communities. So rugby league players used to be 
working men, and now of course we've got working women, who were part of the community, they'd go in the local pub, they'd go in the local shop, they'd go in their local petrol station, whatever it may be, they would bump into locals all the time, and they'd clearly be representing them at the weekend, right? It's certainly prevalent in England, or it was, but since the sort of Super League era and the broadcast era and some people getting million dollar contracts, we seem to have lost that connect a little bit. And I'm making a call out to any NRL team, any NRL player, any player playing in Super League, whatever. I know that you may be a bit fed up you're not making finals, you may be a bit fed up that you've not got a contract at your club next year. But you know what? There's at least a few thousand fans who come to your game, who live and breathe for the club you're representing. They are not very wealthy, so when they go to work, they have to count their pennies or count their cents, and they do everything they can to make sure they are at the game every single week. I know I've got family that do that in England. They're not well off, but a big sum of their money goes to supporting their Super League team home and away. The same happens with an awful lot of people in Australia. We're traditionally a working class game, and people have to battle every day to earn a crust, and they're putting a lot of their hard-earned money to come and watch you play at the weekend. Whether there's 500 of them, 5,000 or 50,000. And you've got a duty to those people because the way you play affects their week. If their team doesn't do well on a Friday, Saturday or Sunday, they might be moody for 24 hours. They might be somewhat down. That's your duty, players. So try forgetting about yourselves for a little minute. Put them first. Put the people who pay your wages, and even those who don't turn up to games, they pay for subscriptions, for television, for streaming. It's not cheap. And you owe it to them. To put in every week. And I guess all that is ever asked from any fan of any team is that you try hard for your team. Now... You might not realise you're trying hard, uh, not, tr not trying hard, but you know the difference. You might not be putting in the work during the week with your recovery, with your diet. You might be taking a few shortcuts, you're starting to wind down the season. And many of you have paid really good wages, particularly in the NRL. I know a lot of you don't get the best wages in the world, I understand that, but you're privileged. So, every week guys, turn up. Turn up for the people that are in the grandstand because some of them are spending close to 50% of their wages just to support you and the way you perform impacts their week. Do you agree? Do you disagree? I'm going to some questions that I've had uh, over the course of the week. I can see there's some comments there. Bomber, I'll get to yours. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. Uh, Trev. Um, I am going to get my friend James Var James Varley to add to that about the Cougars because I think that there's something happening there, isn't there, in terms of um, they've been promoted and things are going in the right direction. And James, I can see I can see you've commented. I'll, I'll have a look at all that soon. But I've got some historical ones to go through. Lee West from Melbourne is a pommy, right? We're all, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. He wrote to me talking about the top and bottom teams in the NRL and the divide that seems to exist. I think we all agree that the NRL used to be a super close competition and now there's clearly a sort of top eight that look a lot better than the bottom eight. Um, and Lee West uh, argues, and you know, I think he's right that it's changed in the last few years, is there enough talent to grow the game? Well, Lee, I think that if we had the resources to cover everything in the game... And I think if some of our recruitment people in the sport weren't learned lazy, so learned laziness I call it, 
And what I mean by that is when you've been in a role for so long, you just, you, you know, yeah, I'll just ring this guy, he'll know where the best players are, I'll just ring this lady, you know. You don't turn over every stone. When you start a job and you're really keen to progress, you, you leave no stone unturned, don't you? Well, after a while, you start to relax. And I think there's a lot of people in, in positions in rugby league who have been there for 20 years. They're not accountable to too many people. And I think what's happened is there is enough talent, but we don't find it. There's something like 4% of Australia's populace gets to the NRL. Now, bear in mind we're a country of 25 million people. That's an awful lot of people that we're not looking at. Next week, I'll be in a remote remote-ish area of Australia and I can guarantee that the NRL, the QRL, whatever have not been to that area and if they have it was five years ago or four years ago and it was once and I think that's a problem so I think there is enough talent I just think we need to get better at finding it. Last week I spoke to you about the impact of the AFL and the impact that's having on rugby league in, in Australia. Um, if I'd have mentioned everything that I know and that I've heard, then it would have been a three-hour special on the issue. But I just want to throw in another another story. I've been involved with Schoolboy Rugby League up until last September for well over a decade at three schools, one in Sydney, two in, in Queensland. And along all that time, essentially, we've been hustling Rugby League to try and get some kind of assistance. Now, assistance can come in many forms. It can come in financially, it can come... Development officers, whatnot, whatnot, whatnot. It's fair to say that all, particularly in Queensland, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack, right? I'm not saying people didn't want to help us, I'm just saying it was hard. One of the schools I worked at, and I won't name them here, but all I'll say is that they're in a very big rugby league area. Last year was approached by the AFL to host a AFL program at that school. This school is one of the top schools in Queensland Schoolboy Rugby League right now. They were offered a six-figure sum yearly to host this program. They were also offered floodlights so that they could be installed at the school grounds at no cost to the school and not only that the AFL wined and dined the executives and the heads of department from the school to get them on side right in the middle of rugby league territory they're coming for us last week I also mentioned the winning and losing dynamic and I questioned the research or I asked questions about the research of taking away finals for many of our kids and taking away results and just to clarify my position i'm very keen that sort of infants in school so primary school kids i understand taking that away i think once we're in high school we need to teach resilience through winning and losing and there's a theme that comes through especially when i talk to you the people who are watching and listening and the people who talk on facebook tanya colvin said why is it like this for rugby league but not other sports my daughter has had scoring and finals since her third year of playing netball Yet my son didn't experience this until his eighth year of league. Matthew O'Neill, the longer I remain out of the game, the more I don't want to return. I don't like what sport is becoming. You're still on my page, mate, so you're sort of clinging on. Come on, stay, stay with us. I'm clinging on, stay with me. Belinda Phillips, hated it when they first brought non-competitive till 13s, but I agree. <coughs> Pardon me. Don't forget to write bless you in the comments. I agree with it. There is an ugly side to coaches and parents during semis and finals. Agree. And this is the this is the thread that starts coming through from comments. Clubs are back to putting kids together with a similar skill set from under 11s again, which is definitely the way to go for kids to progress in the game. Pretty sure the research you're talking about found or helped them decide that no competitive football until under 13s because parents need to learn resilience and above all respect for game and officials and coaches etc yeah look I can't sit here and disagree with that I guess my difference is I'd sort of want it to be under 11s under 12s but we're talking you know a matter of months really in difference aren't we Philip Brock on Facebook 
It's about retention rates. It was found that kids were dropping out of the game because of the win at all cost attitude of some coaches. Brad Crossland, what's in place now would work perfectly if implemented properly with patience. I also think when we are talking about resilience in sport, that is up to the parents and coaches to guide their kids and players through not a competition model. And Dale Island said it's wrong. Everything about it is wrong. Well, I think to summarise that, guys, I think the problem is coaches and parents, isn't it? It's not the kids. It's not the kids, it's coaches and parents. And my question, my next question is that I'll bring up this week is do our coaching do our coaching programmes, do our coaching courses teach people, teach the coaches the importance of their role in terms of teaching resilience, teaching mental skills, the importance of winning and losing? What barriers are in place? What licenses are in place to ensure that coaches who behave too far um because I think we all agree that a coach that pushes too much in a junior element um, probably is taking things too far. And a lot of it isn't malice, but sometimes it can get misappropriated. What measures are in place to pull that person up? What warning system is there? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to go to your comments in a minute, but just in case you don't know, a couple of notices. Um, the Aim Higher programme goes around Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne in the next school holidays. If you don't know what I'm talking about... I'll tell you about it soon. Okay. Trev Rooney. How do you think the Cougars will fare next season in the championship after sealing promotion from League One? Not an L-related, but hey, as you can tell by my accent, mate, I mean, I do know exactly where Keithley is, and um, I understand that they've gone to the championship, and I congratulate you if you're a Keithley fan. Look, I think as long as they're financially in a good spot, then they can recruit three, four, or five players that can help them succeed in the championship, where it's going to be a massive step up. Any jumping division is a big step up. And I think your first task is just to stay in that division. So I can't talk specifically about the Cougars because I don't know much about their circumstances, their playing roster, etc., etc. But I do know it's a proud old club. I've played there, I've watched games there, and I'd love to see Keithley kicking some goals again, metaphorically. Um, James Speedy Varley. Um, called Speedy because he drives a bus. The blowouts in the NRL from the weekend show that several teams have been clocking off. You're right, it's disrespectful to the supporters for players not to try hard enough. I even heard it suggested that there is not enough talent to go around all the clubs. I heard this comment made on an NRL chat show with Gus and Paul Gallen. Please give a shout-out too to Keith Lee Cougars on sealing their promotion from League One at the weekend. With an unbeaten record so far this season, it sets up good derby matches with Bradford Bulls next season. Now, James gets to nominate something to charity. Nominate some money to charity because he mentioned the Bradford Bulls there next year. James Speedy Valley, find him on Facebook and make sure he does it. Troy Fisk. The man down at Narang. Totally agree. The talent's out there. They just don't get a look. Totally agree, lad. Um, Trevor's responded to James's comment, I think. Um, There's plenty of talented players, says Matthew Williams. Just not enough pathways or coaches. In my opinion, they really need to boost the New South Wales and, Co- and Queensland Cup. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Uh, of look- A way of looking at it. Um, I think that's certainly more accessible for the populace to get there so obviously if you don't want to leave home in certain parts of Queensland then if you can go through your Queensland cut pathway then obviously you've got more chance of getting picked up and then hopefully getting something that encourages you to move to to a bigger and better competition and Thomas Hunter great to see you again parents also put pressure on coaches in many ways sometimes it's a drag to be a coach mate I've got your question in here too from last week I promised you I'd read it out this week, so I'll 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 get to it now. Well, who I want to talk about now? I didn't mention these before, but I want to talk about the Gold Coast. Did you know that the Gold Coast Titans started in two thousand seven? The Titans, not the other two hundred goals of it. They've only made four finals appearances in sixteen seasons, and this will be one of the years that they don't. What is apparent is when you look at their successes over the years, or their four successes, is how they crash the following season after reaching finals. So that suggests a bit of a boom and bust, right? So without digging into their salary cap, digging into the way they do their finances, that would suggest to me they pay a lot of players, 
a lot of money, a few players a lot of money, some not others, and then when they leave, blah, 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 blah it all crashes. Their average attendance is, as the Titans peaked in their second season, 21,618, but they troughed in 2019. Now, that was pre-COVID. They went down to 11,500, 11,587 on average, to be fair. Around about now, it's at a middle ground, fourteen to 15,000, and overall, not particularly linked to perf- team performance. So I've got to give some credit to the administration of the Titans and the marketing team and whatnot. Their crowd seem to be levelling out a little bit. Prior to this... For those who don't know, and those who do know, it might stir up some memories. We had the Gold Coast Tweed Giants, 1988 and 89. And they finished 15th and 14th in 16-team competitions. They then became the Seagulls. And their first season in 1990 was their highest position. They finished 15th. And then they went on to win four wooden spoons. They nearly became the Gold Coast Gladiators. But they did become the Gold Coast Chargers in 1996 and finished 18th out of 20. And a stick, a st- boom, put my teeth back in. Historically, if you ever went to a 20 team comp, the Gold Coast franchise had got worse and gone below 16, right? So they finished 18 out of 20 this year. The one anomaly, 1997, when it was a split comp, ARL and Super League, because of the Super League war, they finished 7th. And played finals in the Australian Rugby League competition. The Australian Rugby League version of the competition. In 1998, which was the last season of the Chargers, they finished 19 out of 20. 19th out of 20. Crowds during that period, they averaged between 5,500 and a peak of 9,468 in 1992. So their figures, their average figures were hovering around there. And the figures, the average, dipped to 6,782 before the Seagulls' demise. So, let's have a look at this a little bit. There's a few excuses. A lot of people who talk about the Gold Coast, they will talk about their team seems to be a transient nature about the Gold Coast. I'm not far from the Gold Coast. I know what it's like. And there tends to be an older generation who live there. I indeed know people who were retired who've moved from Sydney or Melbourne and moved up to the Gold Coast. I understand all that. And there's a huge internal migrant population in Australia. So wherever you live in Australia, I think you always look at somewhere like the Gold Coast or somewhere where you'd love to holiday. And therefore, anywhere you holiday, you probably want to try and live there one day if you can too. But I think... Any analysis of the Gold Coast, if we don't scrutinise heavily the way it's been administered, both through the game, through the game's administration, but also internally, as in the club. Can you imagine if, during this time of the Gold Coast having a team, we had a stable administration, one brand, one venue, imagine where we'd be now. Melbourne Storm seemed to do it okay in a place where... Rugby League hardly existed. And Gold Coast is a really strong area. The local clubs, the local competition is really strong. It's a strong junior area. I also wonder if people around the Gold Coast associate more with their club. We've got Troy here who's at Narang. Do you associate more with Narang than the Gold Coast Titans? Please, please pass comment and anybody else who's got any kind of connection with the Gold Coast. But let's look at some of the historical issues that have that have plagued the Gold Coast Titans. They had seven chief executive officers between 1988 and 1995. So that wasn't the Titans, sorry, that was the previous, you know, the Seagulls, the Chargers or whatever it was. They've had various ownership models. They've had various identities on the Gold Coast. They've had five different brands and therefore the premise of the jersey. I mean, that hideous thing the Titans wear now what's that colour scheme, what does it mean, what does it represent, I mean when you think of Manchester, you think of Manchester United, Manchester City, United are always red, City are always blue, when you think of the Roosters, they're always in dark blue with a chevron, St George, white with a red V, what is Gold Coast, what does it represent, you know, what's the colour scheme, where's that coming from, I look at it from another way too, and I look at it from the South East Queensland perspective, they finished above the Broncos a few times in their recent existence, in the last couple of seasons in particular. But what is interesting 
is that since the Titans have entered the comp in 2007, the Broncos have never won it. So the Broncos last won their competition, the competition, sorry, in 2006. The, the Titans entered the comp in 2007. And to put that in some kind of context, the Broncos had previously won six, and that's more than the Melbourne Storm, Penrith Panthers, Newcastle Knights, North Queensland Cowboys, Parramatta Eels, Canberra Raiders, and New Zealand Warriors. So the Broncos traditionally are one of our best performing teams, and the first 20 years of their existence, they won six premierships. Since then, they've won none. And one of the reasons might be we've got another team in South East Queensland. And that's dangerous when you consider that Redcliffe are coming in. That's dangerous because wherever you live in South East Queensland, some people are Broncos fans, some people are Titans fans. If you know some talented players, some of them get picked up by the Broncos. An awful lot more of them seem to be getting picked up by the Titans. So what's going to happen with Redcliffe? And it's already starting. Some people have switched their allegiance to Redcliffe. We'd be stupid to think that people who live in Brisbane support Brisbane. People who live on the Gold Coast support the Titans. People who live in Redcliffe will support the Dolphins. It's not how it works. And I think what's happening a little bit is that every junior player, every administrator and every spectator is getting pulled from pillar to post. And we've not had a massive influx to South East Queensland population-wise. We've had a big one and it's improving, it's getting bigger. But who's moving here? Are they rugby league fans? Are they not rugby league fans? We don't know. And I think we're putting too much pressure on a smaller population. This isn't Sydney. This isn't Sydney where we've got millions. It's a smaller area, South East Queensland. And you know what else is going to challenge it too in the next 10 years? The Olympics. So, I certainly think that there's so many things that add to the Gold Coast malaise. But I think what is certainly clear is that if the administration and the administrative house is in order, and they stay in one place, with one brand, then they've certainly got a chance of making some improvements. There are some green shoots of recovery showing in the Titans, but will the Titans ever work properly? Please write in your comments, and I'm going to have a look down there now. Um, just in case you don't know, um, there is a YouTube page that you can go on. It's on... Uh, YouTube and you just have to type in Rugby League Coach and you will find my ugly face and a few other ugly faces. We're on Q Queensland League scene each week doing an analysis with my old mate Taylor Brown um, and you'll see plenty of those clips on there, coaching tips and whatnot. Matt Lester, there's plenty of talent but it's the same kids getting picked in rep teams year on year. Sorry, I've just lost your quote, let me get back to it. There's plenty of talent, but it's the same kids getting picked in rep teams year in, year out, regardless of whether they trial or not. That's that learned laziness I was talking about, Matt. So, why go to a trial or why look at a trial in detail when you know that a kid was good last year? Just pick him. That's why kids walk away from the game and then talent is lost. So, you're left with only a handful of kids getting picked up by a selector and how many are as good at 17 as they are at 12 great points these but it doesn't matter by then does it the good 17 year olds are over it and walked away matt comment of the day so far thank you very much for that and i hope i represented it okay sioni morning coach morning sioni troy i do i I do, I guess. I got behind them when local juniors get up, but in saying that, born and bred Brisbane, mate. Okay, so you're more of a Narang person, Troy. Is that what you're saying? Troy also asks, how do you think a system in Super League would go over here where they win that year, they go up a level? I just don't think promotion and relegation is part of the Australian psyche, is it? And I think that... Um, the whole franchise thing in the NRL makes it hard for a Q Cup team or a state league in New South Wales to go straight up. Although I'd love to see it. You know what I'd love to see, Troy? NRL Division 1 and Division 2. That would certainly be one way of uh, making the comp a little bit more interesting towards the end of the year. 
Matthew says Storm have also won six comps. You know what, Matthew? I actually agree with you, but I was just trying to play the political card there because I firmly believe that even with the salary cap issues, I still think the endeavour, the coaching endeavour, the playing endeavour, still deserve some recognition. I don't think stripping them of those titles was absolutely right. So I do actually agree with you, Matthew, but officially they've only won not six, four. And Thomas said Redcliffe will take the majority of the talent. You might have a point. Let's see what happens. It's uh, it's certainly um, starting to emerge. And Dominic Cummins, my mate in England, said, now then, thanks for that. Um, I'm surprised you're showing your face after United beat Liverpool the other day, the only time I've ever supported United. Uh, last week, the great, the legendary Carla Joseph, mother of Keely Joseph in the Sydney Roosters NRLW squad, and also mother of Shirley Joseph, who's in the Australian Schoolgirls squad. Cara sent an email last week because we were talking about the women's game, and she said, since the conception of the NRLW, I've been very vocal in my opinion. Who? You? Uh, that in order to create and grow a fan base, the NRL need to create opportunities for many who would not traditionally choose to watch a game to have the ability to do so. Agree so far. As much as the reschedule of the 2021 NRLW was disappointing and frustrating for many, COVID and the rescheduled 2021 NRLW season did just that and in essence has backed up my theory. Because the new NRLW season began prior to the 2022 NRL season, many people had not before watched an NRLW game tuned in. Correct, correct, correct. The comments from new fans are exciting to read. My suggestion has always been... When playing the women's game beside an NRL match, they play the NRL match first, followed by the NRLW. So we're talking about curtain raisers last week. Um, so you're arguing that the curtain raiser could be the NRL game. Particularly with a TV schedule in Cara, like if there's a 3 o'clock NRL game, play the women's game at 5 o'clock while there's another game on the TV. I think that would certainly uh, help matters. And she also gives a shout out to Newcastle Knights who did exactly that last week. Thomas Hunter last week asked, I would love to know what people's thoughts are about parents knowingly or unknowingly pushing their kids too far or pulling them away from the sport and how they can pull themselves up or encourage them more. Um, mate, I think we sort of answered that in the earlier stages about the winning and losing thing, that the parents and the coaches are the common denominator there. What measures are in place to control them? That's my that's my point. I think behaviour at grounds as all around the world has dipped somewhat in the last year or two, and I would argue that um, the game has lost a little bit of its way in that. And we need to put more measures in place to try and get better standards in and around. I know it's not easy. I'm not always critical of the game's administration in this. I'm just saying. I'm just trying to keep them a little bit accountable. It's nearly 7.35 and I was hoping to get a guest on, right? But this is something that's that's very close to my own heart and, uh, and perfectly timed. Um, hopefully, if our guest comes on, then we can bring him in at just this right time. Mike Fanarki asked... What do you think of kids repeating year 12 at school? For me personally, I don't like it. Everyone knows they're repeating to have another crack at their Open League team. School coaches have a lot to do with this also, I believe. Um, why? To win that top dog title. And... I'm, it's just my guess. Um, to win that top dog title, I suppose, it plays no part in improving the kids' future aspirations. The kids are better off going on to starting an apprenticeship or TAFE training. It also brings up the problem of other kids in year 11 and 12 missing out on their opportunity to play Opens for the school. Those kids have had their turn. Let them go so they can start their working lives and let the next crop have their turn. All schools do it in league and union. I don't like it. How do you see it? Mate... I've been a little bit guilty of it. But I guess my argument is that when does education start and end? When do you stop learning? You can never do enough learning. Number two, always look at it a case-by-case -case basis. Some people just 
shouldn't stay at school. Others, they've got no option. The amount of kids I've spoken to, particularly in Queensland, who don't have any idea what they want to do at 17, because traditionally the school years end earlier in Queensland, or ended earlier than down in other areas, then you're actually giving them another option. And rugby league, whether we like it or not, is a good option. I totally understand where you're coming from in terms of impacting other kids who come through the system. I guess it's just the nature of the beast now. Schoolboy rugby league has got huge all around Australia. And on that note, and on the sort of last five minutes of the show, and I do know our guest is trying to get on, he's probably working out how to do it, then it's time to talk about the Langer Cup final today in South East Queensland, and my old school where I was head coach, uh, Ipswich State High School, are in the Langer Trophy. Um, John Dore, their assistant coach, is asking how does he join it. Ask on the page. Might not be able to get him. I wonder if I can invite him. We'll work on that. What I'll do is I'll get through I'll get through what I'm gonna get through and then hopefully we can we can we can get him in. The Ipswich State High School, I I went there in twenty thirteen well late twenty twelve, set the program up in twenty thirteen and we had a, for those who don't know, we had a big rise through. Probably doing the thing, some of the things that Mike's saying he didn't like, but everyone's doing it. So um, we went through the third division undefeated, second division under defeated, and then we went three years during my five year time where we finished second in the Langer Trophy. So twenty fifteen was our first year, twenty sixteen and twenty second, twenty seventeen. You may have heard of Ronaldo Bolotalo. You may have heard of Philip Sammy, will they come through that system? And Tremaine Spry, who's played some NRL games um, for the Titans. He was there and came through that system, and there's likely to be a few more. I don't think we're going to get our guest on. I think he's struggling how to, how to work it out. Um, or maybe I've not set it up for him. We'll work it out. The, the, the school that was set up from scratch is quite a unique story, really. It's actually finished top two in the Langer Trophy of five of the eight years it's played in it. So 2015 was the first year. But the difference here, right, and this is where I'm proud, and this is where uh, I want to give a shout out to all the guys there, is that this is the first year where they've gone undefeated. The problem is they changed the format of the competition. It, it went from first past the post, so if you finish top of the, of the Langer Trophy, you won it. And then this year it's been changed into... A final system that gets to the Langer Cup. So today, Ipswich, having gone undefe undefeated all year, so even when my team's finished second, we lost one game. Like, I think we lost to Kibra twice by six points. You've heard of Kibra, you've heard of Palm Beach, you've heard of Wavell. Well, this is their best team so far. They've got an Aussie schoolboy in their side. Today at three o'clock in Wynnum, they play Palm Beach for the chance to win their first ever Langer Trophy. The closest we got to it is a couple. Um, my third year in the competition, so my fifth year in the job, we missed out by a conversion. Um, two years later, Josh Bretherton, the head coach, took them really close. But I think this is the year that everyone thinks that this they're the best team, and hopefully they're going to make it because they've you know since I left they they, they had a wooden spoon year and they had to requalify. But then they've really steadied the ship. Second in 2019 and 20 and 21, they finished fourth alongside schools like Marsden, Wavell. Um, and they've been putting the pressure on. They beat Kibra this year. Um, they've not lost to Wavell for a few years. So, yeah, there's a, new, there's a new school in town, Ipswich State High. Best of luck to everyone at Ipswich State High. I know Johnny Dore is desperately trying to get on he's texting me now asking how i do it mate i'm doing a live show what do you want me to wipe your bum for you at the same time get on the live and it should give you an opportunity to to join the live i'm going to end it in a few minutes anyway john if you don't hurry up you've just interrupted me emotional speech there's a new school in town the place means a lot to me 
Um, I'm so glad to see it. I'm hoping to get there tonight. If if not, I'll be watching it on the live stream. They're playing against Palm Beach Corumba, and you'll have heard of many players that have come from there over the years. So, obviously, that's a big hurdle to overcome. Palm Beach have traditionally been one of the strongest teams in this competition over the last five years, even. And I think, regardless of what happens today, you've had a great year. If, if Ipswich do win today... They'll next week play against the, the best team from North Queensland. And if they win that, they then get the opportunity to play the national final, which is absolutely awesome. So, Bredo, Dory, Harris, Pooley, anyone else, Steve, anyone I've missed, Campbell, the boss, you know, all the best today. Enjoy every minute. Bob McBree said, I'll see you at the game today. Go Ipswich High. I'll try and get there, mate. Uh, um, I've got a few things that I've got to juggle around. There is a few of us actually that that, that want to watch it, but there's a couple of my mates can't get there, so I'm thinking of hosting the live stream at my house. Um, let me see if I've got any new comments before I go. Um, Thomas Hunter is telling you to press live chat, mate, or is he telling me to play? Bomber Breeze, do you think my old school at, at Ipswich will win the Langer Cup, mate? I think... I think they are the favourites, aren't they? But I guess that can be a problem when um, you are the favourite. It can put pressure on you yourself. Um, let me see if there's anything I can do to get Johnny in. Profanity filter, no, we're not going to one of them. Polls. There's all sorts of things you can do on live here. I never knew there were all these things. I, I should have done more, more testing. Um, live dashboard, live insights. I can't work out from here how to get... I might be able to invite Johnny on. Um, is there any more comments that any of you want to put in there that we can address? Otherwise, I'm going to get rid of it. Mike, is that answer all right for you, mate? I suppose I guess it's much more about a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and I hope that you know you accept that I've been guilty of doing some of that. So, um, But I'm traditionally a teacher, traditionally a coach, and... I was all about doing the right thing by kids, and I think it absolutely is um, a case-by-case -case basis. Look, I'm going to give up on, on getting our guest because I'm playing around with my computer, doing all sorts here. I'm going to end up cutting you off. Good luck, Ippy High. Whatever happens today, you've done everyone proud. I'll try and get there. Any questions, any points, any comments you make in the next week, I'll put them in. I'll be here next Wednesday, but I'll be talking to you from Mornington, Ireland. All the best, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Take care.